started this journey together. From lighting our homes to lighting up our faces, we've kept each other safe and lifted each other to reach new heights. We've brought our loved ones closer together and made so much more possible. We are at the forefront of an unprecedented energy transition and our lives and livelihoods, economies and communities depend on change. What will our future look like? We want it to be sustainable. We want it to be equal and connected. A change like this doesn't happen by itself. We need to work together with more practical and fearless solutions than ever. From students to CEOs to lawmakers, each of us playing a part. Organizations and startups working together. We are the future of energy. Welcome to Shell E4 Demo Day 2020, India's largest gathering of energy entrepreneurs. My name is Devashish Gosami. I am the general manager Shell E4. I'll be the host for the day. Over the past two days, you have witnessed several insightful discussions by key industry leaders and also met startups working in the future of mobility and uh, digitization. The theme for today is uh, the future of energy. In today's sessions, you can expect to hear from industry leaders and startups working in the energy ecosystem. We're also very happy to present the EFO cohort for 2020. They'll be presenting their pitches and talking about their solutions and how it is impacting the innovation ecosystem. Before we get started, a few key points to be noted. Uh, firstly, kindly be seated at the right posture. Number two, kindly ensure that the volume of your devices are just correctly. Number three, kindly be aware of DV alarms close to you. And fourth, fourthly and lastly, uh, please be aware of the uh, exits near you in case of any emergencies. Kindly do not listen to this uh, session while you're driving or while you are walking. Now, to get started, I would like to invite Mr. Arun Padmanavan, IT Manager, Carbon Management, Shell India, for his uh, welcome note. Hello, everyone. As we go through these unprecedented times together, I hope you and your loved ones are staying safe and well. My name is Arun Padmanabhan. I'm the ITM for Carbon Management for Shell. Today, it is with great pleasure that I welcome you to the Shell E4 Demo Day. Energy transition is nothing new, but the one underway is urgent as it is essential. As we continue to grapple with the repercussions of the COVID pandemic, we must not waver in our focus on the long-term goals that we have set for ourselves. It is for this purpose that Shell E4 is motivated to enable, encourage, and empower the already vibrant entrepreneurial ecosystem in the country and the innovative solutions contributing towards a sustainable, lower carbon future. This program provides a platform for collaboration and conversation around valuable energy transitions, offering startups an opportunity to bring their ideas to life with Shell's guidance and support. Shell Technology Center Bangalore is one of Shell's three innovation hubs, the other two being in Amsterdam and in Houston. At our Bangalore Center, we house R&D, technology, engineering, project activities, downstream, and several other businesses, all under one roof. This provides a unique incubation environment for the chosen companies, pursuing path-breaking energy solutions in various areas such as mobility, sustainability management, pollution monitoring, energy storage, plastic recycling, among others. At Shell, we constantly strive to strengthen our commitment to partner energy entrepreneurs and take steady step towards India's transition towards a sustainable tomorrow. On behalf of the Shell E4 program, I'd like to thank our partners, ABB, AVL, WBCSV, Maharashtra State Innovation Society, Indian Angel Network, and Catapult. I'd also like to extend our thanks to our numerous mentors who have given so much time, support, and invaluable guidance as part of the Shell E4 journey. If you're a global energy technology startup, consider this rare opportunity. Shell E4 has recently announced the opening of applications for the international track, a program that supports startups looking to establish a presence in India where things are fast changing. Welcome again to Shell E4 Demo Day 2020. I'd now like to introduce Kirit Mandavao, VP for Shell Ventures based in the Netherlands.
Hello everyone, my name is Geert van der Waal, I'm the Vice President of Shell Ventures. I'm sorry I can't make it live to you today because of the COVID-19 situation. I am prohibited from traveling internationally. We're actually facing a bit of a lockdown here in the Netherlands again. So you'll have to do with me from my home office here close to Amsterdam. Thank you for giving me the, the time and the floor today to open up day three of the E4 demo day and talk about the future of energy. It's clear that the magnitude of the energy transition is very daunting. By 2050, the number of people on the planet is expected to grow with another 2 billion people. And the world needs to find ways to provide energy to that growing world population with rising living standards while reducing its greenhouse gas emissions. And this is probably the largest challenge that we will be facing as human mankind in the decades to come. One thing is clear, the energy transition will not be easy, but we can accelerate it by advancing innovative solutions, business models and technologies together with entrepreneurs like yourselves. Whether we're looking at the fast changing mobility landscape or the impact of digitization on the energy system, the pace of change in our industry is unprecedented and it's really exciting to be part of that. As Shell's corporate venture capital organization, Shell Ventures aims to be at the forefront of this change in advanced technologies and new business models that are disrupting the global energy system. We have a particular focus on technologies and business models in renewable power and in mobility. This is where we believe the biggest impact can be made to achieve a lower carbon future. In the power space, the world is expected to see increased electrification, with renewables complemented by natural gas meeting customer needs that range from energy access to electrifying our homes, to electrifying the way we move from A to B. Within this space, Shell Ventures has taken minority interest in numerous companies, like for example, Husk Power Systems here in India. They are one of the world's leading off-grid utilities and provide reliable power to rural communities and businesses entirely from renewable sources of energy. In other parts of the world, we have invested in, for example, Norway-based Corvus Energy. They are a provider of integrated battery systems, energy storage solutions to the maritime sector, which is a sector that is really, really hard to decarbonize. And in the United States, we have invested in a company like Palmetto, who provide end-to-end -end solar solutions to homeowners. In the mobility space, we see fast-changing consumer needs related to personal mobility, where consumers expect and demand yeah, better convenience and more choice from their transport system and better connectivity with their mobile devices. We also see a greater diversity of fuel systems being introduced. On the medium term, we'll see introduction of LNG for transport being introduced at scale. We'll see more biofuels being used in aviation. We'll see more electrification of smaller trucks. And also, we believe that on the long term, there's clear momentum for hydrogen. But for that to happen, prices need to come down. As Shell Ventures, we have therefore invested in emerging business models that use digital services such as Drover, that's a UK-based car subscription company that provide a flexible and more frictionless digital experience for consumers when they acquire a vehicle. And we have invested in the US in a company called Revel, that's a provider of shared electric mopeds in cities like New York City, where they help people who live and work in congested city environments to get around and, and to get where they need to go. Despite the very different nature of our portfolio companies, there's also clear commonality between them. Um, they each have a very important role in disrupting their respective part of the energy system. As an investor, Shell Ventures has the opportunity not just to support these companies financially, but also help them deploy their technologies within Shell. As such, we have a small group in Shell Ventures that help our portfolio companies you know, connect with the various Shell businesses and help us grow those businesses, for example, new energies and mobility. This is an important part of the role that we have to play as Shell and as Shell Ventures, as we strongly believe that the most essential part of the definition of innovation revolves around the word deployment. To conclude, I would just like to say that I realize that these are very difficult times, very challenging times for startups like yours. But we're in this together. I'm, I'm fully convinced that it's more important than ever to support the development of innovative companies like yourselves that are developing solutions for a more sustainable energy future. As the global economy will start to recover in 2021, there will be an ever increasing need for more and cleaner energy solutions to spur economic growth and to retain the momentum of the energy transition. Through programs like E4, we capture the opportunity to work together between you know, innovative startups like yourselves and big corporates like Shell. So therefore, I'd like you to enjoy the rest of the program and I wish you success in your endeavors.
Thank you, Gert, for sharing your insights about the future of energy. Before we hear from the startups, I would like to introduce Harriet Floyd, a future energy lead Oricon. Harriet will be facilitating a fireside chat with prominent thought leaders, speakers, including David Hahn, a chief climate change advisor, Shell, and Anna Barlow, chief science and innovation officer, Asahi Beverages. While you hear from the eminent speakers, request you to bring forward your most pressing questions on the future of energy and leave them in the box next to the video player. Hi, I'm Harriet Floyd. I work for a company called Oricon and I'm based in Melbourne, Australia. I look after a team that's uh, called Future Energy. And basically what we do is we work with a range of clients in the market to explore the challenges of today's energy transition, whether that's commercial, regulatory, or technical challenges. And I'm today, today I'm your moderator for this fireside chat. And I'm really excited to introduce um, Anna and David, who will be having uh, some very diverse discussion uh, from two different perspectives this, uh, today. And Anna, I might go to you first and ask you to introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. I'm Anna Barlow. I'm the Chief Science and Innovation Officer at Asahi Beverages, responsible for R&D and also uh, the innovation culture at Asahi Beverages. Um, I work with the commercial teams and also the R&D team to drive our innovation um, program, including a lot of our sustainability efforts, particularly in packaging and um, zero waste to landfill, for example. Thanks, Anna. David, perhaps I could ask you to also introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you. So my name is David Hone. I, I work for Shell and I work in the Shell Scenarios team uh, that's split between London and The Hague. And our job in that team is to, you know, to look at the future of energy and, and to think about where the energy system is going. Uh, my particular role as Chief Climate Change Advisor in Shell is to bring the perspective of the climate issue into the uh, energy discussions and think, you know, how that issue in particular is shaping the energy system. Thank you, David. And uh, given your, your, your role, I might throw this first question that I have to you. Now, the, the energy cost curve is trending towards zero. And if energy does become free, how does that change the world? Well, I think it's a great question and perhaps worth unpacking a little bit at the beginning. You know, there, there is a cost associated with energy, and, and I think that you know, it requires a lot of infrastructure. It requires equipment to, to deliver it to the home or to factories. So it's unlikely to be free. But perhaps we could imagine a world in the future where energy is very low cost or, or perhaps there's a, you know, like a mobile phone data plan, you pay a regular monthly fee and then you can use as much as you like. Um, but I think, you know, low cost energy, which is a possibility in the future, particularly with technologies like solar, uh, brings the prospect of, you know, uh, unleashing sort of the commercial engine of the world and, and, and all sorts of new technologies emerging. Um, you know, lower cost energy transformed the 20th century. Uh, it, it, energy use ballooned by something like a factor of 10 over 100 years as the world went from a relatively low population to quite a high population and development proceeded at an extraordinary pace. And, you know, we ended the century with things in our home that we didn't even imagine existed at the beginning of the century. And a lot of that was to do, to do with the provision of energy and the provision of energy at quite low cost. You know, look what the oil industry did to the uh, automotive sector or to the mobility or to the, the ability to, to travel. So think of energy in that in those terms and then imagine what low cost energy does to the 21st century. Anna, does that uh, resonate with you? Do you have a perspective perhaps on this? Yes, I agree with um, it will certainly unleash creativity. I think the, the watch out with it is if um, all that energy is available and people start to use it. Um, what else is going to be the flow-on effect from that? I think there's some quite interesting examples of where things are 
um, you know, cheap or more easily available. I think we have that, that situation with plastics. Um, you know, they start to become prolific and then they become a problem. So it, it probably will require some regulation um, to, to make sure that it's not overused to the point of creating problems upstream or downstream. Yeah, so how to how to incentivize good behaviors in a in a free market, so to yeah, speak. Precisely. Yeah. So um actually touching on that, what are the different scenarios that you perhaps see for the future of energy? Uh David, if I can go back to you again. Well, you know, that's I work in the Shell Scenarios team, so that is uh certainly one of the things that you know occupies our mind and, and we look at. And uh, so I think one thing is quite interesting about the energy system now is that it, it is heading in a different direction. So, you know, for at least the last 30 or 40 years, the percentage of fossil fuel in the energy mix has been completely static. Around about 80% of the energy consumed is fossil fuel energy, and, and that hasn't moved but by even less than a percentage point. Um, but I think that that direction has now changed. Perhaps what's not appreciated is that the time it will take to completely turn over this system is, is considerable. But even if left to its own devices, which is just market forces, technology uh, and society, the energy system will trend, I think, towards near zero or net zero emissions. It's really now a question of when. Now, the Paris Agreement and, and limiting warming to you know, as little as 1.5 degrees C demands that that happens in the next 30 to 40 years. And that's simple maths around you know, how much carbon we can put in the atmosphere. And that's, that's a very, very fast transition which will require quite an impetus from, from policymakers and society itself. Uh, really deliberate choices would have to be made. If we're a bit more carefree about it all, and, and I'm not advocating we should be because, you know, that there is a pressing issue to resolve, um, it, may, it may be, you know, into the next century before we finally resolve the problems. But, of course, then we plateau at a higher temperature than demanded by the Paris Agreement. But I think the key component now of the energy system is that it is slowly but surely trending to a different outcome to the, to, to the one that we've seen over recent decades. And, and I think that's, that's something that is pretty much locked in and, and underway. Mm. Anna, do you think it's a similar story from the Australian side of the, of the world? Yeah, I think um, we obviously have a fair bit of sunlight here that we can take an adva advantage of. Uh, having lived in the UK and in, in Australia, I can certainly uh, recognise the difference. Um, but you know, I think there's a lot of um, barriers to overcome from a, a cost and technology standpoint. If the technology does continue to speed up like it is um, and the cost goes down, then you know we, we may well you know, get there albeit slightly warmer than we'd like to be. Um, but it does take a concerted effort from everybody. Um, and I think this yeah, is definitely absolutely. David's area of expertise rather than mine, so I certainly <laughs> doubt his, uh, his perspective on it. Well, you just started talking about perhaps some of the biggest challenges that are, are you know, facing us in this, uh, making this energy transition. Perhaps you can walk us through where you see the biggest challenges, um, perhaps from, you know, specifically your manufacturing context? Sure. So for, for us, I mean, one of the biggest challenges we've got in converting to um, largely solar um, and other renewables is, is the infrastructure that we're actually putting it on is quite old. So if you're building a greenfield site, um, you do have the opportunity to build and design, um, you know, for a future um, renewable strategy, um, even if you don't start um, with that at the very beginning. I think with manufacturing assets and distribution centres, which are 20, 30, 40, sometimes 50 years old, often they haven't been built um, able to support that sort of weight on their roofs. So we're, we're going to really rely on technology where things become lighter, easier to install um, to, to enable us to get there. Um, you've also then got the PPAs, your power purchase agreements. There has to be enough of those around um, for companies like us to be able to participate. 
and you know as more and more companies have um, these uh, goals in their um, particularly in their corporate social responsibility areas you know there's just not going to be enough to go around and it'll be the ones that get in first that that are able to secure those PPAs um, but there may not be enough for everybody so you know I think that plus the pace of technology there's been some great things that have been you know sent out um, through the airwaves, which you know, probably 10, 15 years from reality. Um, so we need some of those to speed up as well. Yeah, David, do you um, have a similar view on the challenges? Are you seeing similar infrastructure and commercial challenges, or slightly different lens on it? No, I think I think that's a, a good observation. I like the the sort of the practicality of the the weight of you know new equipment that has to go on an old roof is yeah. is just you know such a grounding in the reality of the world um, which which gets skipped over you know by by many many people in their their zeal and enthusiasm around new technologies um, but they don't always fit in in quite the way that you might wish for or hope for so you know the the experience in the energy system to date you know over over the last century is that it it takes a good you know, 25 years, so a generation for, for uh, you know, a new energy technology to move from uh, sort of first ideas and first implementation to, to something meaningful in the energy system. And, and meaningful in the energy system is, you know, one or two percent, which is where we are with solar today. And, and you know, the, the, the first solar array that was put up for commercial electricity generating was done in, in California in around about 1983, but by an oil company, actually, uh, Atlantic Richfield Company. And, um, it, you know, that's been quite a long journey. That's that's now, what, nearly 35 years later, and, and we just take it for granted and assume that it's, it's growing rapidly, which it is. But nevertheless, what that means is that the technologies that are going to transform the energy system in the short term are ones that are already here and are very active and and well you know well down the commercial cost curve uh, so whilst we look at technologies like you know hydrogen and and um, you know so and even some of the, the the sort of advanced nuclear technologies that are you know entering the discussion phase again don't imagine that they're going to fundamentally change the world in the next 10 or 15 years. Uh, they may in the future, and, and hydrogen is an interesting one because obviously it has commercial application and has had commercial application for decades, but not in day-to-day -day use by everybody in society. Uh, so, you know, that, that will put a different lens on, on that technology. There's doubt there's going to be problems that are crop up using hydrogen in day-to-day -day service, you know, outside industrial complexes that, that we haven't we haven't tackled yet and haven't haven't even haven't even seen yet. So you know I don't want to cast a sort of a, a, a shadow over the energy transition, but it will take time. There are a number of technologies today that are racing to the fore uh, and that's good. Um, but the complete transition where everything is replaced is, is the long haul. Yeah, absolutely. Well, perhaps staying grounded in reality, um, perhaps I can ask you, David, do you think the, the world has broken the link between rising economic activity, energy demand, and energy-related CO2 emissions? So I think we've we're close or perhaps have break, broken the link with rising CO2 emissions uh, because there are now clear alternatives and clear mechanisms at hand for new activities to be very low on CO2, low on CO2 or, or no CO2. But I think the, you know, it has the overall link between growth and energy demand been broken? No, I, I think, yeah. As we said a bit earlier, you know, the 20th century saw tremendous growth, but it also saw in economic terms, but also saw tremendous growth in energy terms. So put yourself forward, you know, into, into the 
22nd century with all of the things that you might imagine the world could be doing? Uh, and do you really think we'll be using less energy than today? I mean, there's an underlying pressure, which is the population is still growing. Now, I think there's good evidence that that could plateau in this century. It, it certainly, almost certainly needs to plateau in this century for it to be even remotely sustainable. Um, but there's a lot of, you know, there's billions of people in the world who are still moving rapidly up the energy ladder, uh, and the, or the, at least the economic ladder, which will ultimately mean the energy ladder. You know, they don't have refrigerators in their home. They don't have cars or, or a means of transport. Uh, they don't have, you know, things that we just take for granted that are quite energy intensive, both to make and obviously then to use. And so that means that I think there's still a lot of energy demand to come. And then, of course, you know, put yourself back 100 years, you wouldn't have imagined all of the things that we use energy for today as being something that are just, that's just so accessible and so available. Uh, you know, some of these were almost bordering on science fiction and we just take them for granted. So, you know, throw yourself 100 years into the future and, and, and think of the world like that. Well, that's a, that's a really exciting proposition. So, Anna, I might ask you to get your crystal ball out <laughs> and maybe maybe uh, have a think and, and reflect on what emerging technologies do you see um, playing a part of the future of energy? I think um, this is a really interesting question because a crystal ball would be wonderful to have in this, particularly if you were looking to invest in the energy sector. Um, <laughs> it would certainly help point you in the right direction. Um, there's been some interesting things that I've been um, looking at over the last few years, um, both in the role I'm in now, but also in the role I worked in previously, where we were looking at, you know, portable um, coffee machines and things for, for people to, to buy their coffee from a street vendor with absolutely no um, power required. And, and those sorts of things would be, you know, these solar paints that you could cover your entire van with if there was ever enough of it to... Um, to power a coffee machine, I think that'd be those sorts of things are interesting. I've also seen some new technology a few years ago in cyanobacteria that were producing um, producing uh, like a, a essentially a bacteria a bio style type thing. Um, I'd love to see those sorts of things uh, coming to the fore. I think David's point though that it takes 25 years tells me we're still probably. 22 years away from uh, seeing some of those things becoming commercially viable, which is a shame. Um, but if this, the pace of technology for those kinds of things can come forward, then those practical problems such as the weight of solar panels on a roof go away. Um, you know, as you're getting to um, more urbanisation and you've got countries that are, you know, people living in, in cities, we need to think of ways that we can put, um, you know, buildings up that have already got these things built in, whether that be the, the infrastructure such as glass tiles that might have um, photovoltaic cells in them. Those would be wonderful to see too. Um, I'd love to know your opinion, David, on <laughs> whether those things are a reality anytime soon. Well, they certainly they certainly exist. You know, I, I've read lots of articles about these sorts of things. Uh, you know, clearly, uh, you know, there's companies now offering roof tiles that are effectively um, solar PV cells, uh, and, and that's something that's again become a commercial reality um, and is starting to deploy. But but you even think about that, and the first time that various entrepreneurs started talking about solar roof tiles is getting up to five to 10 years ago. And you're yep. now just seeing the first houses uh, in some parts of the world being, um, being set up like that. So, you know, there's a little micro example of something that's always takes a little bit longer than the, the, than the expectation. Um, but I think, you know, many of these things will, will come to pass. So that I agree. Buildings that harvest energy, you know, will, will perhaps be more commonplace. If the glass that, that collects solar PV or solar energy is, is the same cost really as commercial regular glass, uh, it's just going to make its way into, into the system. Um, I, I think it's a question as to whether you do it for every application because, you know, 
it's, it's the question of you know how the sun shines and, and what the what the ambient conditions are in cities and as to whether ultimately it makes sense. But I think yeah, there's lots to cover in this space, uh, and we're just starting to see the beginnings. But again, you know, these things will take a while to to reach full commercial deployment and just be as commonplace as a mobile phone, which you know, 30 or 40 years ago was a rarity. Absolutely. And then you, you touched on cost there, David, and I think typically energy solutions are incredibly uh, CapEx intensive. So I was wondering if you've got an opinion as to how startups, you know, who perhaps don't have the capital behind them can best contribute to the future of the energy market right now. Well, I think one of the things that is changing is that some of these energy solutions are becoming more modular, meaning that, that they scale down. Uh, you know, solar is a great example. You know, you don't have to spend half a billion dollars building a power plant to generate electricity from solar PV. You can have a relatively small installation. Uh, and, and, and now there's, you know, battery solutions at a local level so you can generate electricity on a 24-7 basis, you know, in a remote site for a small business, for example. Uh, so that's what I mean by modular. And, and I think that's a change that, uh, that perhaps is quite exciting. And there are, you know, it's, you know they're not always practical for, for, for whole countries, but micro wind turbines and, and, and as I said, micro solar, um, these types of technologies are, perhaps will change that. And I think they, are, they provide an opportunity for startups. You know, another way of, you know, another mechanism, of course, we're seeing a, not quite a revolution yet, but certainly changes in the way things are manufactured using, you know, technologies like 3D printing. It's, you don't have to build an entire factory to make something anymore. Uh, you can you can do it on a relatively small scale, and of course many startups are doing this, and they're using Kickstarter funding to um, to build things with with three D printing technology, so they can set up you know a factory that builds particular you know commercial items in not quite in their backyard, but in a small industrial area, and um, and off they go. So modular technologies, I think are part of the future, and, and I think they make it interesting for startups. Anna, um, can I ask you to give us your view of the future of startups and their contribution to the, sure. the energy market? Yeah, so we've been really lucky um, at Asahi. We've had a chance to dip our toe in the water of working with some startups, and I think uh, where startups can really contribute is by working with larger corporations and doing some of the test and learn that perhaps we may not have the resources or necessarily the inclination to do because of risk. Um, particularly with consumers, we know that consumers are interested in um, sustainability. What we're also trying to find out is if we invest in certain types of energy, do consumers care if the products that they're made are made from renewable energy or not? And then we've been working with um, a startup that came through the Startup Bootcamp program in Australia um, to, to basically help us put on pack um, claims around you know, where our plastic bottles have come from, what sort of energy they use, um, and, and is that consumer compelling? And the more you see feedback from consumers as to whether it, it you know, helps them um, to make the choice to buy our products versus our competitors, um, that's something that a startup can do with us um, you know, at relatively low cost of entry. I mean, we can test it um, with very little risk. And so I think really understanding what problems can be need to be solved, um, identifying the pains and, and gains is really where the startups can play and work with us um, together on that in, in different types of partnerships. That's fantastic. I love the comment about trying to identify the pains and gains there. Um, that's really getting to the crux of the problem, isn't it? And that's something that we need a lot more of. We need those problem solvers in this highly complex energy market that we've got here. Um, now, I just wanted to wrap up and just say thank you so much for your time today. Um, I hope you both enjoyed the conversation. Um, I think, you know, key takeaways for me were I think everyone wishes we had a crystal ball and the real problem solvers of this generation and the people who 
ground themselves in today's reality and not necessarily getting lost in a hundred hundred years from now will be um, the first people who will be able to contribute to the success of our future energy market. So thank you very much. What an insightful discussion. Allow me to take the opportunity to introduce with great pleasure some of the startups from the Shell EFO cohort of 2020 who presented their pitches over the last two days. Hi, my name is Divik. I'm the CEO and founder of Go Green EOT. Go Green EOT is a deep tech electric vehicle startup uh, which started off in 2016. And I, as a founder, have about 13 years experience in the electric vehicle space itself. At Go Green EOT, we have an L1 approved vehicle for ride on Indian roads, which is longer in terms of range, which is safer from a battery perspective. And the battery that we have has 2x the life as against any of our competitors. And besides this, we, our vehicles also come with advanced technological features. And at a company level, we've applied for close to about 16 patents with about six grants. Tripoli Taxi. We make the world sustainable by transforming the way you travel. It's an end-to-end e-mobility -end e solution provider which integrates the EVs, charging infra, and state-of-art technology together to save companies time, money, and carbon emissions. Additionally, we create a shared EV charging network for other EV users to charge their vehicles. Offgrid is a clean tech company building novel, cost-efficient, and sustainable batteries for stationary and mobility applications. Our first product, Zingel battery, is packed with breakthrough innovations that enable a performance of lithium-ion at one-third the cost, driving disruptive ecological and commercial impact in the various applications. Off-Grid has partnered with global companies in energy ecosystem to build, validate, and deploy its Zingel batteries. Is the fear of how to charge and where to charge keeping you away from adopting clean electric mobility? If that is a problem, we at Magenta, under a brand Chargrid, are trying to solve the challenges of EV charging in India with India-specific solutions, be it the hardware, software, or business models. With over 64 chargers installed and an experience of installing more than 150 chargers across 16 states in India, we are helping empower electric mobility in India. Comitec is one-stop solution for corporate passenger mobility. Corporates can utilize compliant vehicles from Commutex network of digital fleet operators. Compliance, security, visibility, data integrity, and fleet availability have always been five major problems in this $5 billion industry. Stay tuned to learn how Commutex control tower approach resolves these issues while still staying operationally profitable. environmental crisis the world is in is leading to stricter regulations and a stronger need to manage carbon footprint. Business profitability, reputation and the entire businesses are now at risk. Today more than 600 enterprises use the sustainability cloud our software platform to manage their net zero ambitions. With logic ladder the enterprises are shifting from a reactive to a software driven active real-time and predictive approach to manage sustainability that reduces cost and non-compliance risk. We are working with enterprises to create their sustainability balance sheets. Resletics is a software and service company specializing in automation through machine learning and deep learning technologies in the upstream oil and gas sector. Through our technology, we address the key pain points of this industry, which is having low resolution seismic data and having declining reservoir productivity. Our technology provides a necessary enhancement in resolution and information coupled with accurate prediction of recoverables, thus helping our customers improve their well productivity and achieve tangible cost savings. Stellar technology software converts information from within documents into structured digital data. This can be injected into predictive maintenance, interactive publishing, and supply chain solutions. Hello everyone, myself Vignesh, the co-founder and CEO of Gel Technologies. It is an IoT company. We are into environmental impact startup. We develop low power, cost effective sensor based IoT hardware for environmental pollution measurement for indoor and outdoor. 
device will be generate a real time data and will be analyzed and visualized by ai algorithm and generate key insight for policy maker and stakeholder hope you had a good glimpse of our promising startups now you are about to meet the startups disrupting the future of energy landscape allow me to share some guidelines on how you can actively participate firstly you can invest you have been given a notional $50,000 worth of virtual currency to invest in these startups. Please refer below video player for more details. Secondly, you can engage. During the pitches, please feel free to ask questions in the box next to the video player on your screen. Thirdly, meet the startups. At the end of the presentations today, move on to the live virtual booths and actively participate with the startups and ask and hear on their disruptive innovations and scale up journey. You can find the unique profiles on this platform to access their virtual booths. Finally, connect with the startups. If you are an investor or want to connect on potential commercial opportunities, click on the contact startup button on the dedicated profile. Now allow industry experts who are customers and partners of our startups and we'll be introducing our startups. Please welcome co-founder and CEO of Green Jewels, Veera Raghavan Sankaran. APKME has a sophisticated pyrolysis technology. For one, they have a super track record on safety in a domain like pyrolysis where you have to deal with complex hydrocarbons that are extremely flammable. For potential investors, such a track record is of paramount importance. Secondly, if I look at the process itself of how APKME converts raw materials or waste to potential simpler hydrocarbons, it's extremely sophisticated in that they have resolved all challenges around continuous operation of pyrolysis plants, something that their contemporaries are still struggling to do. In that sense, AP Chemie could be at least five years ahead of all of others. And finally, there is quality. There is a pyrolysis oil made by contemporaries' plants, and then there is an AP Chemie pyrolysis oil. It can be used as input into fuel or more complex chemicals, something very, very versatile and which competitors cannot claim to, not as of yet. From Mumbai, India, AP Chemie. Hi, I am Suhas Dikshit, CEO of Epikemi, a chemist as well as an entrepreneur. I founded Epikemi in 2007 with a vision to recycle plastics transparently. At a great environmental cost, more than 300 million tons of plastic waste is dumped or burned yearly. To solve plastic pollution problem, aggressive environmental legislations like plastic tax and EPR are being adopted globally. Plastic is manufactured from crude oil, hence it can be converted back into oil. Science confirms that pyrolysis is the only circular economy solution for mechanically non-recyclable plastic waste. Crude oil is used by the industry to produce plastics and surfactants. Consumer usage sends 150 million tons of plastic waste annually to rivers, ocean and land. AP Chemie offers commercially proven technology and plants to convert this mechanically non-recyclable plastic waste into the required quality of pyrolysis oil which can be used to reduce dependency on crude oil. AP Chemie inspires to be part of the team that makes this transformation happen. Since last 12 years, AP Chemie has been innovating and pushing commercialization of pyrolysis. We are leaders in pyrolysis with over 30 pyrolysis plants commissioned till date. We have published four patents in pyrolysis, including a breakthrough technology for pyrolysis of PET containing multi-layer packaging. We are engineering several 10 to 50 TPD pyrolysis plants globally. AP Chemie is supported by Royal Dutch Shell for technology and business development. We are part of Startup Accelerator program of Alliance to End Plastic Waste. We sponsor research at Institute of Chemical Technology. 
Our global clients include Equate, Uflex, and CPE. And with Green Jewels, we produce Euro 6 quality biofuels. Epichemi has a solid team of 45, with a plan to expand to 100 colleagues by end of 2021. I drive both business as well as R&D initiatives. I work closely with Vijay, who has over 40 years of EPC experience in petrochemicals. He leads engineering innovations with a multidisciplinary engineering research and design team. Aruna ensures that all company operations are sustainable and scalable. We have achieved average revenue of $1.3 million in past four years and a firm visibility of $10 million in next two years. Our exponential growth will come from running our own 50 TPD single reactor pyrolysis plant, which in turn will drive our technology licensing business globally. We plan to license technology to over 100 pyrolysis plants by 2025. Epichemi has an agile business model. We directly cater to the upcoming $12 billion pyrolysis technology and plant market, as well as we work with local investment partners to serve the upcoming $100 billion plastic pyrolysis market. With our proven technology and passion for pyrolysis, we are confident of reaching revenue of $700 million in next five years. For the first time, we have opened investment round. Come and be our partners in success. Epichemi's total ask is $5 million, out of which $3 million for technology scale-up, half a million for R&D, and $1.5 million for human resource and infrastructure. Thank you. Any questions, please? That's a very interesting question, and thank you for that. To be factual, the carbon footprint of mechanical recycling is lesser than pyrolysis, and carbon footprint of pyrolysis is far lesser than incineration. At the same time, it is very important to note that there are three facts. First, the mechanically recyclable plastic waste is not available for pyrolysis purely for commercial reasons. Second, Less than 10% of plastic waste generated today can be recycled mechanically. Rest 90% requires recycling through chemical methods. Third, most of the post-consumer plastic waste which can be chemically recycled with a lesser carbon footprint is going for incineration in cement cleanse and waste to energy plants, causing much higher carbon footprint compared to pyrolysis. Since the last 12 years, we have not raised funds. We have been developing business and technologies with the help of steady revenue stream from sale of technologies and plants. However, now that the time for investment is right and pyrolysis market is going to boom, we want to raise funds and grow exponentially. First and foremost, we have never lost any order to our competition till date. Only Epichemi has commissioned over 30 commercial scale pyrolysis plants and published four patents. Epichemi is at least five years ahead of its competition. Being an Indian company, Epichemi has highly cost-effective research, engineering, and equipment manufacturing capabilities compared to our competitions from Europe and the US. The biggest unfair advantage is Epichemi's relentless passion to innovate. Please welcome Facilities Maintenance Manager from Shell, Praneet Kumar. I'm Praneet Kumar, Facilities Maintenance Manager for Shell Retail India. Our vision is to shape the future we are proud of and make difference to the life's journey. To accomplish this, we have partnered with Energos to unlock the immense opportunities available in energy efficiency, operations and maintenance efficiency, and several optimization opportunities available in retail space. Together with Energos, we intend to deliver this for a greener and a brighter tomorrow. Over to you, Rajesh. From Mumbai, India, Enagos. My name is Rajesh Solanki, and I'm the founder and CEO of Enagos. Enagos is developing an end-to-end -end platform based on IoT and Edge AI to form intelligent nodes 
on evolving distributed energy systems. Distributed energy systems are clusters of energy loads and sources like heating and cooling loads, EV battery loads, rooftop solar, and local backup storage. Our technology is patented and is already deployed by several large corporates like McDonald's and Domino's. It is now being tested by partners like Shell and Energy Australia. We've generated a SaaS revenue of over $5 million in the last four years. However, distributed systems have to deal with some new challenges. They have to manage multi-direction energy flow, deal with intermittent nature of renewables, integrate with legacy systems like HVAC, as well as new loads like EV batteries, make distributed systems resilient to emergencies like floods and fires, and deal with cyber threats linked to being connected to the main grid at all times. At Enagos, we built a single controller come gateway with AI on the edge and remote analytic capabilities to solve these resiliency and security problems, both behind the meter and at the grid level. Our controller has inbuilt AI to control any make and type of heating and cooling loads and reduces consumption and cost by over 30%. It also balances demand with available supply. Businesses avail our services directly and through partners and pay monthly SaaS fees based on control and data points. Our value proposition is to support them on the net zero carbon journey in three steps. Reduce energy consumption and cost from heating and cooling. Reduce operations and maintenance costs through IoT and optimize their new energy investments like solar, storage, and EV charging. Data on a single platform gives high quality insights to our customers, while control capabilities brings the desired flexibility and resilience to the main grid. Our platform APIs integrate with third-party service providers like battery swap services and EV charging services companies. Currently, we are focusing on three core customer segments, global food and beverage chains, retail gas stations with convenience stores, and EV battery charging hubs. We find these segments more progressive in addressing issues related to the environment and hence more keen to pursue business transformation due to changing consumer expectations. I'm happy to announce that together with Shell, we have launched a pilot for Shell gas stations we are helping Shell to reduce their carbon footprint by reducing their energy costs and also their operations costs. In the near future, we will also automate the energy flow from rooftop solar and EV charging points to avoid any demand surges and demand penalties. This will allow Shell to offer lower charging costs to their EV customers. Our solution is entirely wireless and hence easy to deploy. AI algorithms at the edge provide a continuous shared learning model to make such distributed energy systems intelligent, interactive, and flexible. Most competitors have capabilities either on demand side or on supply side. As against that, Enagos has a single controller solution for balancing both energy loads and sources. Our target is to capture 4% market share in these available co-customer segments. That will require us to deploy in about 30,000 locations in the next five years. Potentially, it will give us monthly recurring revenues of US $13 million in the fifth year. I'm a repeat entrepreneur with a successful exit in the past. Anis, our CTO, has worked with a German energy company. Jean-Claude is ex-Panasonic and heads our go-to-market in North America. Together, we are a team of 20 spread between USA, Australia, and India. In 2021 next year, we plan to raise our Series A round of $5 million. If you are excited by our growth journey, come invest in us and help us to accelerate our journey. Thank you. Will your solution work in industrial sectors? Yes, the gateway can work to perform automatic demand response with industrial customers and we would seek partnership with the utilities to provide these services. 
Next question, will you partner with electric vehicle OEMs or with EV charging services companies? Yes, surely with both, we can help them avoid demand surge and demand penalties. Also, we can help utilities to build more flexibility and resiliency as more and more EVs enter into our distributed energy systems. Next question, what growth rate are, we, are you expecting in the next one, and one to two years? Well, net zero carbon is becoming, uh, you know, very popular and gaining momentum with large uh, organizations. And uh, so behind the meter capabilities are crucial to achieve this net zero. And hence, uh, riding on that momentum, we are expecting two to three X growth over the next uh, couple of years. Please welcome principal at Shell Ventures, Siddharth Mehta. Hi, good day. I am Siddharth Mehta, Principal, Shell Ventures India. I am pleased to introduce you to Shell E4 startup Nirvana Energy Systems, which converts waste heat, or basically any fuel, into reliable electricity and heating or cooling, with greater than 90% performance efficiency. With that, over to you, Bert. From Ohio, United States, Nirvana Energy Systems. My name is Bert Hessling, and I'm the CEO of Nirvana Energy Systems. Today, I'd like to talk to you about uh, the status of our company and give you an overview of both uh, technical product as well as business um, aspects of our uh, company. The problem that we are solving is um, a problem associated with energy security, uh, energy efficiency, and making solar and wind dispatchable. The approach that we have taken is based on a technology that we refer to as thermoacoustic power technology. And we have created a product which we refer to as TAPS for thermoacoustic power system. The main benefit of the thermoacoustic power stick is that it is fuel agnostic. It can use gas, natural gas, propane, uh, biomass, if hydrogen becomes available or ammonia as a fuel, um, it would be completely global warming gas free. And of course, diesel and even nuclear power can be used as the heat source. The company is located in Cleveland, Ohio, and was founded about six years ago by my colleague Jim Gibbons and myself as a spin off from Stanford University. The product that we are building is a four kilowatt hybrid TAPS. It has been tested at a customer site. It is scalable to about 50 kilowatts electrical output power. And it has been tested for over a thousand hours. We expect to go and enter the market in 2022. Our company has currently um, 12 employees, primarily in uh, located in Cleveland, Ohio, um, with three or four uh, employees scattered around the US. We have raised two and a half million dollars in a seed round from Floodgate, and we have raised an additional 12 million Series A. The revenues in 2017 and 2018 were about two and a half million dollars per year. Our target market um, is a four kilowatt remote power system and a 10 kilowatt electrical microgrid um, and micro combined heat and power system. The market size for remote power is larger than 3 billion and the micro combined heat and power system has a market cap size of roughly about 20 billion. The technology value proposition that we provide is that we provide dispatchable solar and wind power with TAPS integrated with those renewable energy sources. And we do this at the lowest LCOE, the lowest 
um, levelized cost of energy, which is essentially the total cost required to produce the energy over the lifetime of the system, which is 20 years. By doing this as high efficiency, we reduce potentially the global warming gas uh, generation substantially. The differentiated sustainable advantage that we have is that um, we have the lowest LCV, as I just explained, 20 years of maintenance-free operation, high combined heat and power efficiency of more than 90%, electricity generation at roughly about 30%, similar to what the electrical grid in the US produces. And also of importance is the fact that the same system can be used as a very efficient cryocooler. Our business model is a recurring revenue stream. So in summary, our company um, is in the process now of testing a prototype that we hope will turn into a product uh, going into the marketplace by 2020, making solar and wind dispatchable. Of an important application is currently in the United States in the Western states where many fires occur. During such times, local energy companies turn off electricity generation uh, in order to reduce the risk of starting new fires. But gas is not turned off. So in that particular application, there is a significant need for a solution such as we provide making solar and also wind dispatchable. Thank you for your, your attention. The first question I'd like to raise is about investment. We are targeting the Series B investment of about $20 million. We like to start that fundraising after, after completion of the four kilowatt electric test program. We're looking for strategic investments as well as venture investments. Secondly, we would like to consider business partnerships. We are looking for partnerships relating to marketing, distribution, service worldwide. Also, we would like to collaborate on product testing and work with energy companies to integrate our TAPS technology um, with more conventional energy sources. Thank you. Please welcome Project Manager at Advanta Nevis Business Park. Ankit Sharma. Hi everyone, my name is Ankit Sharma. Uh, I'm from Advin Navis Business Park and we've been partners with iAutomation for the last three years for their BIoT platform. The BIoT platform has helped us in many ways over these last three years. It has helped us to be connected to our buildings even when we are not within our building itself. Uh, iAutomation has helped us to remotely manage our, manage our systems and all our systems, which include HVAC, our fire systems, our electricity, electrical systems, everything is soft enabled and it has brought our operation costs to a bare minimum. We've, we've seen roughly 25 to 30 percent energy savings within these last three years and we're very happy with the platform and we hope for a fruitful relationship going further. From Noida, India, iAutomation. Hi, I am Dharmin Rathor, founder and CEO of iAutomation. iAutomation is a clean tech company. It offers comprehensive view of entire built environment, which could be multi-located assets. The ultimate goal is to deliver healthy and sustainable built environment. Why built environment? Built environment is most important part of our eco human ecosystem because we spend most of our life in some kind of built environment. Our health and comfort is directly connected to the built environment around us. While more than 40% water and energy are also consumed in some buildings, it also has a 40% shares in total carbon footprint which is created across the world. Since built environment is directly influence our business and productivity, we tend to heavily spend on operating and maintaining the built environment. We spend $3 per square feet per year on energy, $30 per square feet per year in maintenance, and $300 on the people works in these spaces. The problem in current systems are 
that they are not able to harness the full potential of the data as 95% data related to built environment either never captured or never analyzed. It does only half work by highlighting problems partially without any actionable steps to make it better. Most of the time we have noticed non-working or very limited functionality building management systems in the buildings and the facilities. How we solve it? So automation changes the delivery model and gives a comprehensive view. We enter in a project with minimum investment required by solving priority pain point of the client, which can be health related parameters like contactless integrated entry management system or indoor air quality issues or sustainability related parameters like energy or maintenance. When customers see value and ROI, we can build the whole IoT platform on the top of it to suit his exact requirement. Looking at the comprehensive view of the data helps to build integrated intelligence across the subsystems and ultimately deliver the healthy and sustainable built environment. We cover entire stake for health and sustainability requirement of any facility. In health, while anti-infectious indoor environment, safety and comfort are important, while in sustainability, compliances, efficiency and convenience would be more and more in focus in the future, post-COVID. As per many established research and case studies by global, global bodies like ESHRE, uh, USGBC, it has been now proven that the digitization has potential to save 30% energy, 40% reduction in power and cost, o and cost, that ultimately translate to increased occupant comfort, which is directly connected to the productivity of the people working in the built environment. We also fixes the business model by adopting proven successful SaaS model as a pay-as-you-go model. While it reduces the upfront capital investment in longer run, it also boosts the confidence in the customer and deliver the long-term commitment. We are not just dreaming about it, but successfully delivered more than 5 million square feet space so far and similar kind of uh, uh, 5 million square feet is under execution and which has been endorsed by leading and global brand names. Most important part is our finding, the case study. Advent is one of our flagship project and we are able to deliver 25% energy saving in last two to three years, while we have reduced the 40% operation and maintenance manpower cost, uh, which is directly translated uh, in fewer complaints from the building occupants. Why automation? Automation unique offering includes 24 into seven command center to help our customer in need. We have a team of energy analysts, data analysts, and domain experts in command center who look at the data and deliver actionable items to the client regularly to maintain sustainability. We own IP of hardware and software both, so we are not dependent on anyone. We offer a scalable and customizable solution to best fit in the requirement of the client. And at the end of the day, if the client still has some issues, then we offer very easy and flexible exit options too. So, who led the digital transformation of your company? In today's scenario, most probably the COVID-19. Thank you very much. Hi, I am Priyank Garg, co-founder for iAutomation, handling product and finance. The first question we have is, are you looking to raise funds? We are planning to raise around $4 million for our Series A round within the next six months. These funds will be utilized primarily for product development and sales and marketing activities. A related question is, how much has been invested in the company? So far, we have invested around $2 million into the company through a combination of angel investors from India and California, in addition to the Shell E4 program. Most of these funds have been invested in product development and initial market validation of the same. Someone is now asking, are you open to any partnerships to reach out to customers? We work with an ecosystem of partners as part of our go-to-market plan. 
We work with system integration partners to do the on-site execution and operations while we deliver the software, the controllers, and the command center services. We partner with smart solution providers to bundle products for customer needs and facility management services to enhance their offerings to their clients. We also collaborate with design professionals and building operation experts for developing and delivering superior performance to our customers. Coming on to some technical questions, the first one I'm taking is, what is the platform on which your solution is built? Our platform is robust and scalable and consists of three broad parts. The front-end interfaces, the back-end system, and the controllers and devices. Our front-end is built on Angular 8, and our back-end is built on Java with RESTful APIs, and both are hosted on AWS. Our controllers run on Ubuntu Linux. We use other relevant dual sets, such as SQS for messaging, uh, KMS for data encryption, API gateway for security and interfaces, and others as required. Another technical and very important question is, what about security and data privacy? We comply with GDPR requirements for data privacy and have customer audited IRM, information resource management policies in place for security. All the data we record is owned by the customer and we have built the system to securely provide our services in compliance with all applicable regulations. We build our algorithms using domain expertise and machine learning based on the wide spectrum of operating environments we manage without compromising customer data privacy. I hope by now you had a good glimpse of our digital startups as we heard from some of the brightest minds today on how they are tackling some of the biggest challenges in the area of energy efficiency, sustainability, air quality management, and ways to value. With that, we have completed speakers and pitch session for day three. Before you head off to your live virtual booths to meet and hear from the startups, uh, remember you can finalize the virtual investments below the video player. Feel free to move around the virtual booths. All sessions will be recorded so that you can view them later. Thank you for the speakers, partners, and mentors. Thank you all for joining us today, celebrating the Shell E4 graduation ceremony. Stay safe. Stay healthy.